All right, so now we're going to do a basic overview of processing. We'll cover harvesting and post-harvest processing. All of you guys should, if you're working with coffee in some way, you should know this. Um, this is this is very important um, because maybe depending where you're working within the coffee supply chain, you interact with the coffee cherry in a different form. So if you're on the farm, you're obviously dealing with the cherry. If you're doing import-export, you're dealing with the parchment and the green bean. If you're a roaster, you're dealing with just the bean and the silver skin. Um, this is pretty straightforward. Something that is done a lot in coffee, um, maybe too much, uh, is comparing it to wine. Um, the reason it gets compared to wine is because they're both high-value crops that have small little details about it that influence uh, the final flavor of, of the cup. Um, so in some ways, it's very similar to wine, but in other ways, it's very, very different from wine. But you could, in a very general sense... Um, say that the processing of coffee um, could be equated to the different types of wines that you get. Um, so on the left, you have the natural process, which would be equated to a red wine. Red wine is um, a red grape fermented with the grape skin still intact, making a red wine. Uh, a white wine on the right side is like washed. Uh, the skins are removed. White wine, people think, is just made from white grapes, but actually it can be made from red grapes as well because once you remove the red skin of a red grape, the inside is white. So white wine is like wash process where you remove the skins um, and, then, and then process it that way. Um, whereas honey process in the middle is a hybrid between the two. Um, in winemaking, they get a rosé wine from two different ways. They either mix a red wine and a white wine together to make a new rosé wine, or they remove all the, the red skins let it ferment, and then at the end, add a small amount of red skins back in to impact the color and the flavor of the wine. Now, in coffee, processing is, is in, the same, in the same mindset. Natural is the idea of developing the flavors and processing the coffee fully intact with the fruit and the skin together with the seed. Washed is you remove the fruit and the skin and you process the coffee bean that way without the fruit and the skin. And the honey would be in the middle where you remove the skin, but you still leave the mucilage intact. And then you dry the coffee. And what happens is you get a combination, kind of like a middle ground between the two different flavors that the natural and the washed give you. The washed will give you a cleaner, brighter cup of coffee. The natural may be heavier body, fuller, richer flavors. Um, and the honey can, depending on the circumstances, depending on the bean, can be somewhere in the middle. That's one of the reasons it gets com compared to wine. <clears throat> we'll go through that step by step, each process. In just a moment. So harvesting technologies. Harvesting is 
um, the last farming practice and the first processing practice. So harvesting can be considered agriculture, but it can also be considered post-harvest. Um, the first process of, 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 of processing is harvesting. And harvesting actually has one of the biggest impacts on the quality of the cup of coffee. So you get manual harvesting, selective harvesting, or strip harvesting. You guys, you guys know what these are. Selective means you could go through a specific farm multiple times within a harvest season and each time only pick selectively the ripe cherries. Manual harvesting by stripping is where you basically go in with a glove and, and take a branch and strip the entire thing, whether the cherry is ripe or not. Uh, mechanical harvesters, um, you get handheld harvesters, strippers, tree shakers. Um, a lot of the large plantations will plant the coffee trees with the correct spacing that uh, harvesters on wheels can come through and strip the trees. Um, and then you also get collection of coffee from the ground. This is the most single-handed, expensive thing you're going to do on your farm. This is going to cost you more money than anything else in a season. Yes, if you're doing a wash process and you have a big processing center and big equipment that requires a lot of capital, that will cost a lot of money. But in a particular season with a particular harvest, this is the one thing that's going to cost you the most money. No, I mean, obviously some methods are cheaper. Hiring strip pickers are cheaper than hiring selective pickers. But your qualities between selective picking and and a lot of the conversations, the conversation several of us were having down below earlier is the same conversation is kind of even amongst selective picking. How do you go from like select pick, selective picking within a range to like precision within your selective picking? Um, one, it's very expensive because without money, convincing people to do it, because it takes double the time, takes the effort, and it, it's not just the time, it's the, I found for a lot of laborers, it's the amount of times they have to um, walk up and down within a field, it's, it, they find it frustrating. Um, there, there's a lot of different cultural implications to this, I think in the beginning, and, and Rian might have also fallen subject to this, I would have just told everybody, you got to pay more money and get better cherries. Because yes, better cherries means a better cup of coffee. But honestly, um, you have to find the balance with your labor, with your workers, with the guys who are wanting to do it, of what they're willing to do. Um, you have to balance that with uh, your processing method and how you then sift it after that, because it will be it will be cheaper for you to sort the coffee later than to pay your worker your pickers double just to get better coffee quality coffee. Does that make sense? Now your yield will be smaller because you're picking all this. If you're not being selective or very selective you have a certain amount of coffee that gets wasted because it's not, it's picked out later, it's sorted out later. Does that make sense? <clears throat> um, but every farm, every place, every location is going to be unique, is going to have a unique answer to that problem, but it does impact the quality of the coffee. <clears throat> Yeah, so so how how efficient pickers can be 
I I was in the Philippines. in August, and it's the first time I've been to the Philippines, and they have a situation where the landowners or the people farming are are the laborers for the area. They don't have migrant workers coming into the Philippines um, working in those regions, and so the farmers are the only people that are there. Whereas in northern Thailand, there's all sorts of migrant workers coming down that people can hire to to help them harvest. So so in the Philippines, the workforce is very, very, very small. A lot of the young people are leaving for the city. Um, so there's there's coffee that's 150 years old growing on these mountains. There's a rich coffee heritage in the Philippines, but there's tons of coffee just being left on the trees because there's not enough labor, and it's some of the most intense... Uh, steep mountains I've ever had to climb up and down. I mean, you almost you almost need a ladder to get up and down some of these mountains uh, where I was in the Philippines. And so to think about having to go through and harvest that um, six or ten times a year is you're a, you're asking people to do a pretty much an impossible. You're asking them to eat a very big apple that they can't fit in their mouth. Eat an elephant, I think, would be the right word. Um, so actually, my advice to them in these in these areas were, they they already couldn't manage their farms. So I said, just make the area that you're maintaining smaller and only do what you can manage and do it well. And don't worry about the rest of the farm. There's nothing you can do about it. Because right now they're trying to do everything and just maybe getting one pass or two amongst the whole farm and they just don't have the ability, the labor, the time. So all these different kind of things, labor, uh, the availability of migrant labor or youth labor or you know cultural systems, the, the slope of the mountains, all these things can impact that. So the further away from the equator and the closer to the tropic line, maturation tends to be more uniform. So that's why he's saying in Indonesia, they have a very long, almost year-long continuous harvest season, whereas you get up into northern Thailand, Yunnan province, China, and you're getting closer to three or four months harvest season, and that's it. But still, within that short harvest season, you are, you have a very, you still have to do several passes. So, natural process. Do you recommend every couple weeks for those passes, or do you have a um, it depend. It depends on. Um, it depends. I know places that are doing it once a week, but in the beginning, of, in the beginning of the the harvest, maybe once every two weeks, and then it gets towards in the middle, in the end, they'll go down to every once once a week. Yeah. So natural process. We'll spend some more details on natural processes tomorrow. Um, but we'll just go through a a, a brief overview of it. Most Robusta coffee throughout the world is all natural process. Um, Arabica coffee, Brazil, Ethiopia, Yemen, Mexico, Ecuador um, are places that are known for their natural process coffees. Natural processes historically have been um, the strip picking at the end of the season. They did not find it worth the money spent on running the machinery to process this through the wash process because it was going to be so much uh, defects and, and bad coffee left on the tree that they just put that to the side, made naturals out of it, and then sold it as, as low, poor quality commodity coffee. This is historically how naturals have been treated.
with the exception of uh, places like Yemen and Ethiopia that have been producing naturals from the beginning and high quality. So the natural process can be as simple as fresh cherries, harvesting them, drying them, and then you have a dry cherry that you send to the dry mill. Or it can be a really complicated of uh, system of gathering your fresh cherries, winnowing them, um, separating them depending on on ripeness or or, or sorting sorting the set the winnowed cherries. Um, Mid drying fermentation. This is just giving an example of like how complex a natural can be. So, in its simplest form, you take a cherry, you dry it, you have a dry cherry, you send to the dry mill. But it can get really complicated. People are doing like all sorts of fermentation or different types of dryings on them to impact the flavors of naturals. That's what this, this is trying to say. So a pre-drying fermentation, this is where people put them in fermentation tanks midway through the drying process uh, in order to add flavor. Thomas has done experiments with that sort of stuff. We'll talk more about that tomorrow when we talk more about naturals. I'm just giving you the overview. The wet process the wet process is pulp is removed mechanically from a pulper. Um, the mucilage is still stuck to the parchment of the coffee and, bu and must be removed before drying. That can be removed mechanically or through different types of fermentation, whether aerobic or anaerobic. The basically a dry fermentation or a wet fermentation. So you have a, a, a mucilage machine right down here, Ryan, right? So this machine next to the pulper is a mucilage machine. It, it cleans the mucilage off of the coffee bean after it's gone through the pulper. The way fermentation does this is that this is a sugary, syrupy substance that is attached to the parchment. And fermentation eats the sugars. Um, during the fermentation process, it eats sugars uh, in order to create tannins and alcohol. And this, as it's eating the sugars, it's destroying the structure, the cell structure of the mucilage. And basically, the mucilage is no longer able to hold on to the parchment, and it loosens it. And this is what's happening in the wash process when you ferment it in order to clean it and get the mucilage off. That's what's going on. Um, very little robustas in the world are washed, but there is increasing amount of robustas starting to be washed, especially in... Uh, high quality robustas. Most Arabicas throughout the world, outside of the countries I listed earlier, are all washed processed coffees. So, a very simplified form of wash process. This is what I just explained to you. You have the fresh cherry, you send it through the pulping machine. Then you take it through mucilage removal, whether that you use the machine or fermentation to do that. Then you dry it to 12%, which now gives you parchment. And then once it's ready to be sold, you send it to the dry mill to have the parchment removed. That is your most basic form of washed coffee. So when you wash processed coffee, you get a better quality product as far as cleanliness and lack of defects, but you're spending a lot of money 
on machines, and then you have to turn around and spend a lot of money on water treatment as well. And you need a lot of you need a lot of water to be able to do this process. Um, you need water when it goes through the pulping machine. It can't go through dry. It has to go through with a steady stream of water. You use water to move it from one location to the next. You use water in the fermentation process. Uh, once it's fermented and then you have to wash it, you use water. And, and all of this water in this process, especially the water in the fermentation process, uh, becomes highly acidic and is really bad for the environment if it's released like it is back into the environment. So um, some farms you use biodigesters. Um, so there is a natural fermentation that happens uh, when you are removing the mucilage, uh, whether it's underwater or dry, I've already said that. Um, you have aided fermentations, different enzymes, inoculum, yeast, hot water. Um, there is a guy, and I think you probably, I think you've experienced with sugar, experimented with sugar cane. Sugar cane and yeast, yeah. And, and yeast, there is a, Another guy I know here in Thailand, they also use a sugar cane. Um, there is a lot of excitement around this because the idea of putting sugar cane in your coffee when it ferments might give it a sugar cane sweetness. There is no, there's absolutely no proof of this so far. What there is proof of is that that sugar cane has with it its own yeast, which can speed up or slow down, depending on, depending on the yeast, the, the fermentation process, which can impact the flavor of the coffee. How quickly it ferments or how slowly it ferments drastically impacts the flavor of the cup. So adding sugarcane doesn't necessarily give your coffee the sugarcane flavor, but it could possibly affect the fermentation and the speed of fermentation. So, pretty much with mechanical demucilization, there is zero fermentation happening. The only fermentation that's happening is the minute it's picked, if it takes it a long time to get to the processing facility, and it sits in a bag before it gets pulped, there's maybe a small window of which the sugars start to ferment. Um, but basically, when you mechanically do it, there, you're, you're, you're taking away all opportunity for any fermentation to happen, which... Um, I personally have not cupped a lot of coffees that way, but the ones I have were not very interesting coffees. That's my personal opinion. Um, there's usually a not a lot of character to those coffees, but it doesn't mean it's not possible. And then how is this mechanical demonstration done? Is just a machine? There's a machine right down here I can show you later. Um, there's there's a couple of different styles, but mostly um, the the beans or the, the the parchment is sucked up, goes into the machine, and there's brushes that spin around. Is that how yours works? Knobs. Metal knobs. Oh, okay. So his is metal knobs. I've seen another one just last week that was more like bristle type type things. It's traveling through this where it's getting agitated. So a very complicated wash process could be fresh cherries, foreign matter removal through siphoning or winnowing, cherry separation, meaning you're sorting out your dry cherries and you're 
or your, your ripe cherries and your unripe cherries. Uh, dry fermentation or wet fermentation, soaking. Um, has anybody ever heard of the term Kenyan wash? Kenyan wash is basically where you do a wash process, you, you ferment overnight or 12 to 24 hours, then you wash the beans properly to get all the mucilage that's broken off away, and then you fill it with clean water and you let it soak another day just in clean water. That's called a Kenya wash. Um, there's all sorts of little nuances and different names and 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 because there's there's coffee has been developed in different places even the same processes have different names in different places like honey process and pulp natural um the idea of pulped natural is that it's a pulped coffee like washed but it maintains some of the characteristics of a natural coffee that's why it's called pulped natural um, but that same process in South America is called honey process. It's actually called meal process, which in, in Spanish is like syrupy. It's the same word they use for honey and syrup is meal. I'm probably saying that wrong. And, and it's because when you process coffee that way and you lay it out, it's real sticky and clumpy. And that's why, but essentially pulp natural and honey are the same thing. So, a pulp natural aims to separate immature cherries from mature ones. Um, so it aims to have the quality control that you get in washed coffee. A honey process allows you an opportunity when pulping um, to separate out bad beans. So the pulping machine, the pulping machine, it gets loaded into a receiving bay, and when it's in that receiving bay, bad coffee cherries float, you take them away. But then when it goes through the pulping process, um, that machine is calibrated for the cherries that you're harvesting. And if you had bad, unripe cherries, the machine spits them out to the side. So anytime you pulp, you improve the quality of your coffee. So the honey process is basically trying to allow you to still pulp it in order for quality, but maintain some of the characteristics of a natural processed co coffee, which has more fruity flavors and heavier body. I think I've explained this before with the wine. It's a in-between system between natural and washed. It basically means it's pulped, but that mucilage that's stuck to the bean is left there and it's put out to dry. <clears throat> my throat's really sore, so I have this in my mouth. Sorry, it's not nice while I'm speaking, I know. There's a couple of really unique things about it in that because it's because it's sticky, uh, any any coffee when drying, washed or natural, should be should be rotated or turned on a regular basis. But it's even more so because with honey, it's sticky and it creates this seal around the it. Like when it's drying on on the surface, it creates a seal which traps the moisture inside. So it needs to be agitated and stirred up more often, especially in the beginning while it's still wet and really sticky, more often than other coffees. Oh, the flies are there? You should market that, like <laughs> fly process. <laughs> So this is just real simple. You have the fresh cherry. You separate the bad cherries from the good cherries. You pulp, and then you dry. That's honey, honey process.
process in a nutshell. Um, there is different types of honey that are referred to. Um, yellow, black, or yellow, red, and black honeys. If you had different types of cherries and you all process them the same with the same amount of mucilage on, you could potentially end up with different colors. The color refers to the actual color that looks that it looks like when it dries. And that can be determined by how much is there, but most likely is determined by sugar content. So um, coffee varieties with low sugar content are impossible to make black honeys. So black is the is the dark color you get from a very uh, a coffee cherry that has a high sugar content and it's honey processed and when it dries it'll be covered in this black film speck type thing but you get some honeys that are just colored covered in like this yellowish and then you get red so the yellow is the least amount of sugar the red is medium the black is the dark it is a way of measuring sugar content is the bricks. The sugar content will affect the fermentation. Um, it will, I mean, on multiple levels, it can affect the flavor and the sweetness of the cup, how much sugar is actually in the coffee. All Arabica coffee is sweet. So saying that one is sweeter than another, yes, you are going to get coffees where it's very obvious the sweetness is different. But when it comes to a honey process or a natural coffee, the, sugar, the way the sugar impacts it is because of fermentation. The fermentation process that it's going through will impact the flavor of the coffee and, not, and the types of flavors so that you're getting. It, it has potential to bring out the flavors more. It has potential to create flavors through fermentation. Um, when you drink a glass of wine, you're drinking flavors that potentially were in the grape, but did not exist in the grape juice, but exist in the wine because of fermentation. It's the same with coffee. You're drinking flavors that the potential has always been there in the coffee, but you only bring it out through fermentation. And the amount of sugar will impact the, the speed of the fermentation, the timing of the fermentation, how long it ferments. It'll impact all of those things. If your goal is qu quantity and quality, then you don't need to worry about fermentation from a flavor point of view. You just want to worry about fermentation as a tool to remove mucilage. You want to take it through the wash process or any whatever process you're doing as quickly as possible. Get rid of defects and produce as much coffee as you want. But if you want to market your coffee and sell your coffee as a unique coffee to the location where you're coming from, you, you want to develop the potential flavor of that coffee to the best you can. Indonesian coffee, in my personal opinion, I'm not a fan. I understand why people like it, but I personally don't like it. But it has something that's very unique that's only Indonesia, which just happens to be what makes it unique is a really improper way of processing the wet process. Yeah. Um, so the wet process, I don't think my notes covers that, so I'll just quickly go over that. What makes Indonesian coffee is a wet process. A wet process is a washed coffee. Um, normally with a washed coffee, you would remove the mucilage, get it all clean, and let it dry until 12%, and at which point, you keep it at 12% until you sell it, and then you remove the parchment once you've sold it. 
But because in Indonesia, the monsoons, the, the short drying days, they want their coffee to dry faster. So they wait till the coffee seed has lost 50% of its moisture or roughly 33% moisture content. And then they send it through the dry mill already um, to remove the parchment. And that makes the coffee bean dry faster. Um, but because the coffee seed is not fully dry, you get a lot of cracking and squishing and breaking. Um, and it's quite common in Indonesia to grow to dry their coffee on the ground. And the combination of cracked coffee beans and drying it on the ground, it's susceptible to all sorts of microbial growth, bacteria growth. And this bacteria is what causes a very unique, earthy <laughs> flavor. But because they're the only one in the world doing it, they're marketing it as Indonesian Sumatran coffee, bold, bold coffee, <laughs> and, um, and they've made a name, and that's the unique thing about coffee. And that's the unique thing about the market is there's, there's markets that love it, and there's markets that want it. And so if you're just trying to, to get back to my original point, is if your goal is just to get rid of defects, have high quality, and make as much as you can and sell it, then, then you don't need to worry about flavor. But if you want to target a market who's looking for something unique, um, looking for specific flavors, then you need to pay attention to these different processes. You need to test each process yourself and be able to analyze it yourself and say, which one of these coffees is better? Which one of these coffees has the greatest potential? Um, and, um, and then also test it in the market. Um, take your samples to the market and see what people like. You know, um, Koreans may want to buy something from you that's very different than what Americans want to buy from you. Uh, but there's all sorts of possibilities with that, with these processes. Terroir plays a huge, the two main factors of your, your flavor are your coffee variety, the type of coffee tree you're growing, and the terroir. The terroir being um, the elevation, the, 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 the local soil, the local ecosystem. Um, these are going to, what we talked about at the very beginning of the day, talking about nighttime cooling temperatures, developing density in your beans, these type of things. So, so potentially the same variety grown in different locations could have different flavors based on the location. So yes, yeah, so fermentation, drying, which we'll talk about tomorrow, the, the parameters of that, but that impacts the flavor. And so any type of drying that you're doing, if you're drying on the ground and you don't have a plastic sheet down, you're susceptible to all sorts of bacteria growth from the ground. That's going to impact your flavors. If you put a black sheet down, then you're going to heat up your coffee super hot in the day. That's going to impact your flavors. Um, um, if, you, if you dry it in a mechanical dryer, that's going to basically limit your fermentation. That's going to affect your flavors. And, and kind of an idea or what people have experienced, but I'm not giving, I don't have a source for this, I don't have data to back it up, but high altitudes, because the bean is denser, you can get a washed coffee with a lot more complexity than a lower altitude. So in lower altitudes, uh, people are finding that naturals help bring out the complexity of the flavor. Um, because they, they don't have the density that the higher altitudes do. But because at higher altitudes they're more dense, you don't need the fermentation to add the flavor and to develop complexity in the flavor, and so you can do, more, you can do a wash process and get a really nice, clean cup of unique coffee. Um, also, something that 
I personally really promote is the African raised beds. It's a table. It's what essentially what Rian has here. Um, it's got mesh on it so air can move uh, up and down or through the coffee. Um, it dries. It dries better. It dries more even, um, and it keeps it off the ground so it's not susceptible to bacteria and things of that nature. I get asked all the time about um, greenhouse or sun room type drying, and that really just depends on air movement and and like how much of a breeze or is there any kind of mechanical means of, of moving? Because if you have something like that, but the air is trapped, then you trap your humidity, which can cause your 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 coffee to stop drying and become mildewy and can can be negative. But if there's a way to make sure that the air is evaporating or moving through or out of it, the extra heat, especially in areas that don't have a lot of sunlight, uh, it can be really strategic to use something like that. Um, but the, one thing that you need to be able to walk away from this weekend is to realize that there is no one answer for anything. Every different situation um, will have a different answer. The principles remain the same. The principle of, of controlling fermentation, the principle that fermentation can be good when it's controlled, and the, firm, and the principle of drying all remain the same, but how those get fleshed out in every different location may be different. And you get guys in coffee that are doing, you know, these sun tunnels or whatever, and they're just like, this is the greatest thing ever. Everybody needs to use it. But that's not necessarily true. There might be some places where there's no breeze. There's no access to electricity to put in exhaust fans. And you're just trapping the humidity, and it's not necessarily good. There's going to be some places where you couldn't do a natural. There's just not enough sun. You probably couldn't do a natural without something like one of those tunnels. It wouldn't be possible to do natural unless you had something like that. All right. Thank you guys for your time. Thank you for sitting patiently and listening. Did you find that helpful? If you did, consider giving it a like or subscribing to our channel. While you're at it, why not check out our other videos or join our network at echocommunity.org for more interesting and sustainable agriculture solutions. Network members can receive up to 10 free seed packets.